Welcome DigiDees to the channel. Today we're playing a little bit of Helldivers 2, but not only are we playing Helldivers 2, we also talk about why AAA titles have not been pulling up to par in the terms of the gaming community. All the way from game mechanics, to game polish, to skins and their costs, to just valuing your gamer's time. So hey, if you guys have ever different thoughts and topics that you may want to have and get out of your mind, feel free to put them down there in the comments below because I guarantee you I will read them. And by the way, we're also going to be playing with a couple of viewers today. These viewers have not only subscribed to the channel, but they've also joined the Discord. And over on the Discord, we got to talking, and then we ended up playing together. So hey, if you guys want to join the community, feel free to join the Discord and get to talking with the other viewers. Thank you for watching, and let's get right on into it. Let's get started. Honestly, for a game like this, you know, albeit it's had its issues, I think they've all been good issues to have in general. I mean, like, what, like your games have an issue from being too popular. We have a queue because your servers are too full. People find it too fun. As aggravating as it may be for a lot of players, it might kind of turn them off in the long run. I, you know, have all the issues to have. I think that's a primary one to have rather than, oh, the mechanics are broken, the game's too glitchy or something like that. So I think it's kind of one of those things that people are going to be mostly acceptable of. Oh, absolutely. And I was, uh, I went on the Discord earlier and uh, people were just complaining about, oh my God, they need to fix the servers. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, the, the first Helldivers capped off at like, 10,000 concurrent players there's no way that even if they knew that this was getting a lot of hype heading in there was no way that they were expecting you know just the hundreds of thousands of concurrent players i mean the last i looked on steam charts it had capped off on steam alone at 450k i wonder what really drove that interest to begin with because like i know we all you know a lot of us played hell divers one but it wasn't necessarily a super popular game that people all knew about it was a very top down kind of rogue like not everyone's kind of forte of game and then as soon as this releases I, admittedly it is very beautiful it is a good fps but it almost has a very Starship Troopers kind of ask feel to it. And regardless, so I wonder why something like Starship Troopers didn't get popular when something like Helldivers 2 is just absolutely astronomically rising off the charts, you know? See, for that, I think it's a combination of the fact that uh, it, this is multi-platform, so it, it's not just on PC. You know, you do have the PlayStation as well, which is going to drive a lot of the, uh, the hype because you also get the console market on it. Um, it's different enough from what you get on the mainstream releases. I think that it's just a matter of, uh, you know, people just wanting something new and fresh. And since this came up with, with such a large audience that uh, it just took off because it was so different from what we get from AAA. I mean, what we get from AAA nowadays is based, it's almost they've like swapped places. Like what you used to think of as like old rogue kind of indie games with small development teams, you know, it used to be kind of, you know, subpar, you know, quality and kind of issues that are, you know, rampant throughout because you're like, oh, it's a small team. You give us oh, a little yeah. bit of leeway. But then now you come into games like, well, well you get like what? The new Skull and Bones uh, Assassin's Creed game? Absolute arcadey bullshit. They call it be like a quadruple A game. It's live service. It's bullshit. It's $60 and they have skins in it that are $60 alone, which is just ridiculous. And then you get something like this. It's like, what, 30 bucks, I think it was? Yeah, and it's just, it's it's simple. And even something like a Deep Rock Galactic Survivor, which, you know, I did uh, a couple episodes on, that thing's only like 10 bucks. And that thing's actually been doing pretty popular, at least, you know, surprisingly a little bit better than I expected. You know, something like that. It's just yeah. very simple games, straightforward ideas have been so much more popular than these abstract games that are just somehow shittier than, they, they throw like $129 million into Skull and Bones and that's what they had to offer, like nothing. Yeah, they, they try and play it safe. And then when, and in trying to play it safe, they also, you know, they, they, they focus too much on the presentation and not so much on the gameplay. Whereas this, it actually looks great, but the gameplay is fantastic too. I mean, hey, I'll do the best that I can, but hey, first dive into a hell divers. Can I get a oorah? Oorah. <laughs> all right, boys, nice some good old health fire. I'm getting reminiscent of Vietnam all of a sudden. <laughs> As people have called this game Space Nom, so. <laughs> nice. Oh, behind us. Oh, I'm loving this. <laughs> that is a one shot that. Run. Running. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are running from uh, the delivery of democracy. Don't worry about like rushing to pick up samples and credits and uh, medals. Um, they are shared pickups, so they, they award them to everybody. Oh, that is a nice touch of details. Yeah, sometimes I know they make them a little bit individual in other games and it kind of makes, it almost feels like it just kind of wastes time. Be like, oh, hey guys, there's something over here and everyone has to kind of run on over and go pick it up. But if you can just do it collectively, that is a much faster game mechanic in general, especially in a very friendly also, like, almost format like this. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like in co-op, it also makes it so you're not competing with your friends, you know, just for 
resources. I gotta say, the aiming mechanic on this is very nice. I do enjoy the swaying capabilities, like the weapon in general. It doesn't give it, doesn't allow that arcadey feel of just like, you know, pinpoint accuracy all the time, you know? Oh, yeah, and you can change your sight range too. Oh, yeah, I love that. This, every, every shot sounds like just freedom being delivered. <laughs> a couple ounces at a time, right? Right. But, you know, I, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a topic. Like, where do you think that maybe AAA games have necessarily gone wrong in today's culture? Because, like, you know, when we get games, even like Power World, like, let's look at something like Power World as an example. That it has definitely gone extreme popularity. I think also because it has the sense of it being Pokemon, but just in a different sense that it has a lot more love and maybe care to it, right? Because when we look at like recent like Pokemon games, their open worldness, the graphics in general. I, as much as I'm not a big stickler for graphics. Sometimes it can really show the amount of like care that a game has given into it. So like you look at some of the more recent like open world Pokemon games, the graphics were very like almost like PS1 style, very smooth. Everything's kind of like flat edged, you know, it's very cartoony. And you get something like Pal World, which is more or less kind of a successor of the same style, but it seems to be so much more crisp and like beautiful and almost in a weird Fortnite-esque kind of style too. Black, hard black lines and building capabilities and stuff like that. So I'm not really sure where it is like in today's culture where like maybe a lot of these kind of smaller games are doing better than these bigger games. You know, they have so much more money and yet they seem to not really give as much love towards the community that they seem to be building upon like decades of effort, you know? But no, when it comes to, to like, you know, games like you mentioned, like Power World, kind of giving people a different take on franchises that they've, you know, always wanted, but it's filling in, you know, a niche that wasn't really being, you know, filled. Um... So Power World was letting people live in a world with, you know, with, with Pokemon-like creatures that they could, you know, capture and then do like a survival type game with, even though it was very obviously, quote unquote, legally distinct Pokemon. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, especially too, because I think, I think a lot of people almost got, it was almost ironic that some of the popularity of Power World came out of the fact that people were kind of trying to defend Pokemon in some like legal case in a way. Like in all reality, a lot of the a lot of the pals, I guess we'll call them, are very different from Pokemon. And also, I guess the whole the whole argument too is that Pokemon was also kind of stolen assets from another. Like also, when you look at Pokemon, they've been doing it for God knows how long, like 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 a decades at this point, and they've made Pokemon that were just fucking chandeliers for God's sake and snow cones. Yeah. Like at what point do you just like oh they're copying? It's almost like oh, Simpsons did it. Simpsons did it. Like yeah, they've been going for so long. They've done everything at this point. They almost got exactly. copyright and everything. Like. How do you not copy it? <laughs> you know, like, Yo, yeah, and when people are like, oh, well, Power World is just this, you know, this cheap copy. It's like, Power World's, at, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's like, you know, there may be things about that are quote unquote cheap, but they did it in a way that made it fun. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, but look at how horrible the things people are doing. And it's like, yeah, well, if you Pokemon lore, there's a lot of really messed up stuff in Pokemon in the lore. Um, Power World parodies that by just making it so like the horrible stuff is right there in the open. They don't care. They're like, oh yeah, look at you. Know, you have a uh, you know, you have sweatshop style slave labor. You're butchering the things that you know, you're <laughs> capturing. You know, they they wear it on a sleeve and they do it you know so tongue in cheek. You know it, it's it, it's silly and fun and also you know I, I played a bit of Power World and you know I had a blast with it. And granted, yeah, I eventually got tired of it, but uh, you know th that's how any game really. Right, and I, I think it really does kind of also feel that itch of like people, for especially a game for a game that's been going on that long, such as Pokemon. It's always it's kind of feeling that itch of just like okay, but we all know like why don't they just do this? And like I remember playing the original Pokemon's, like you know, the yellow version. Jesus Christ, Hellfire from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was me calling down some napalm. I was like, there's a bunch of bugs in there. They can have fire. <laughs> Mid monologue, and then suddenly hell. <laughs> but, uh, I figured you see the uh, I figured you see the call in Bika while we're chatting. <laughs> right. Um, but like, I think it also kind of just fills the itch of like people being like, okay, I remember playing my very first Pokemon games and be like, okay, why am I this like 12 year old boy running around the entire world, taking on entire like corporate organization of doing crime. And you're telling me that their only means of fighting against this 12 year old is throwing down like a, like a Goldeen against me. Like my, this guy has enough power to probably bench lift me 12 times over or just, you know, pull out a gun, <laughs> you know, like. Oh yeah. You tell me that all all oh, of these, oh, you know. Charger. That's the charger. Oh, okay. He's charging towards me. He's charging towards me. <laughs> Thanks for the support, Hell Diver. <laughs> Colin's carrying the uh, orbital railgun. <laughs> he, he, he tagged the charger, just like no. no I thought that was just some good done. timing. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Oh, it was both. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Again, mid monologue suddenly. Yeah. But then I, I think in general too, like I feel like a company should almost stay back away from their development of their almost yearly games. You got stuff like your NFL games that come out every year, your FIFAs. You got your Call of Duty, which is almost yearly. You know, I, I've honestly been really loving how I think almost Halo multiplayer has been making a really big comeback, which I am a huge Halo fan in general. I Those were some of my very first original games that I ever played. The first lores that I ever got involved in. So when it came to Halo Infinite, I personally, I think the Halo Infinite story was really good. I think it fills in a lot of gaps. It also feels a lot of, it also leaves a lot of room for the story to be developed in other directions. So Halo 7 is kind of already in production. Rather, I think they're just going to add on another campaign onto Infinite, almost like a live service type of situation. But, you know, it's, it's almost seems like a cat. It almost seems normal nowadays for most like live service games to just released a very shitty version of their intended content and then wait a couple of years to actually make it into something nicer so it's been kind of a you know it almost feels like they should just wait you know in general try to release something that's good to have a lot of popularity for people to get into and love it immediately rather than just having to wait for it to be developed into something worthwhile and that's something that in general has been hitting the entire game industry and you know, you can you, you can kind of trace the progression because like, you know from when it used to be like pre-order bonuses and all that stuff and you know there was a time you know it's like I, I remember you know back when I was in my you know late teens early twenties you know it used to be the whole thing that the idea of a beta test was to actually go ahead and uh, you know provide feedback and it you know you, you know you knew you were getting a subpar experience and these days they turn it into a marketing tool. Um, which is, you know, which is the reason why eventually, you know, we got, you know, Steam Early Access, which was supposed to be what the whole idea of once again, the beta testing of, hey, you know, this, this is for a smaller developer. You're looking to go ahead and, you know, get, you know, give them some support while they're developing the game because it's for a smaller developer. Um, it's, you know, while meanwhile, you can give them some feedback and companies start being like, well, hey, if they can release stuff early and get money, why don't we just do that? Well, let's fix it later and be like, oh yeah, you know, you just let gamers expect it to be broken on release. I think a game like this, a game like Power World, part of the reason why they get popular is because they come out highly polished compared to AAA titles. So many AAA titles come out unpolished these days that when something comes out with good polish, it, it, you know, people are you know pleasantly surprised by it. Right, like to where you see a game actually being operational upon release is almost grounds enough for it to become popular, even if whether or not it's a good game or not, simply by the fact of like, oh, hey, this works. Because I, I think there's important, I, you said something there, which I think really it piqued my interest, is that you said that beta testing almost seems like a marketing tool nowadays. Because I think that is very prevalent, that we see a lot of times these betas, or, you know, quote unquote, early access, they do it like two or three weeks prior. And like, oh, so we can get data, get analytical data, we can go ahead and um, improve the things that you guys need to be improved. But then the official game will come out, and none of the things that people have been very vividly and vocally just adamant about that they need to improve and change and yet none of those things will happen almost nothing seems to improve all the way from early access to actual full quote-unquote release you know it almost it almost seems yeah so honestly you get any game that honestly just works and it's almost gonna become popular and that's you know that's the thing is yo know, you know when you when you look at hell divers it's like hell divers can't you know came out and you know for the first couple of days you could get in you know right away any time of day just because you know the word hadn't really spread on it and uh while they have server issues now, that's because of the popularity. And why did it get popular? It came out in a fun state, feature complete. You know, they aren't, you know, they aren't sitting here, you know, screwing people over for money. You know, people, some people point out, oh, but they have, uh, you know, they have, you know, the ability to purchase super credits. We've picked up super credits in the mission. You earn, just by playing, you earn super credits at a fairly quick rate. And, all that they have for sale in the super credit shop is just basically reskins of armor that you can unlock throughout the uh, the normal track anyways. Um, oh, they've also said this, that it rotates. Just, just in this mission, we've picked up 30 super credits so far, I think. Yeah, so you get plenty of super credits just playing the game. It, uh, you have to be extremely, extremely impatient to want to drop money on more super credits in this game. And like I said, you know, it's just reskins of the stuff that you can, you know, buy through the uh, normal progression it's like stuff you get in normal progression unlike in most games that try and sell you stuff that's a reskin it doesn't look bad you know, a lot of games that you know, sell you, you know, they'll, all, they'll sell reskins the base items look horrible and it's because like oh you want to look cool spend money here there's like you want to look different 
go for it. It's customization. Right. And I, I think really a big part of it, that, that's another thing. Like, that's how you know that a company may, you know, may be valuing the gamer's time. Because, like, again, I think I was saying about it earlier that, you know, Skull and Bones, the new Assassin's Creed game, some of their skins are literally $60 for the entire grouping of how to get enough, like, silver, I think they call it, in order to buy it. And they do that dumb tactic, like let's say a outfit costs 900, but you can only buy 800 credits and they'll make you basically buy it twice to try to get that amount right. And they, they do that crap all the time. Yeah, that 100 leftovers isn't gonna be able to get you anything at all type of situation. So if they allow you the ability to not only just gain skins throughout your gameplay, but also gain the credits to acquire better skins, that is a great part. But I think it also comes down to the value, right? Because I really love Elite Dangerous, which is very obvious from some of my movies that I've released that I've been using a lot of the Elite Dangerous universe to kind of catapult the starts of the universe that I've been making and the stories and whatnot. But the things that I've always loved about that, although they've moved over to arcs at this point, kind of the, ah, the currency is still a little bit of the same. Die! <laughs> <laughs> you little onion bastards. Um, you know, I'm I, trying to make I, a I, point I, here, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's okay. I had to make sure I didn't, you know, pull the trigger because I saw weapons and I realized, the you know, grenade at danger close is not so friendly. <laughs> right. A lot of their skins that they had for a majority of the ships, all of them cost like one to two dollars. I think I think the lowest was two dollars. It was like two dollars for a skin. Like that's that's very simple. And like you get very attached to your ships too. So it wasn't even a like, oh, you bought two dollars or you want to buy like, you know, seven other skins. Like usually you buy like one or two for the ship that you really want and you stick with it. And it, for it being such a cheap price that you found that a lot of people were more, oh God, <laughs> did we just get an A-10 Warhog? <laughs> Colin once again going really close with the, uh, <laughs> with the cluster bombs. Yeah, a lot of games, you know, when you look at what their pricing is on their monetization, it's just so abusive to their players. Whereas when you get a game where they either aren't charging anything for you to unlock things or they're very reasonable prices, you know, as a player, it makes you feel like, hey, this company actually, you know, cares about the player experience, which is a very uh, refreshing thing. And once again, you get that with Helldivers, you know, uh, it's like the, the game respects your time, you know, everything is unlockable at a, at a reasonable rate, you know, there's nothing that is locked behind a, you know, behind a paywall. Right, and I, I think another very important point, which you, you, you mentioned there for a brief moment, was if respecting your time. Because I, I feel like a lot of companies nowadays, and games in general, are still trying to market their entire viewer base towards, well, honestly, towards children, because they're very easily manipulable, they're marketable, you want a lot of them in oh, general. Yeah. But I think they market a lot of stuff towards children is the fact that they can, they have summer breaks, they have spring breaks, they they have the time to go home even after homework or just not do their homework and just play a game for eight hours a day. I mean, God, I remember when I was a kid, I, I would use this, I used to have like 48, 72 hour binges doing nothing but playing Halo and like MW2, you know? Oh but yeah, I, me too. I remember that. I remember right. those days good. <laughs> but then the thing is that a lot of well, the population that grew up loving those games who have been becoming a large portion of today's gaming community, we're older now. You know, I got a full time job. I, I have maybe a four to five hours after work to not only just you know cook food, do my bills. I got things to do in the weekend. I got things to shop. I got I got taxes to pay. I got I got people to take care of. I got all this crap I don't want to do, <laughs> you know, and the last thing I want to do. <laughs> right. And the last thing I want to do is sit down and be like, all right, I'm going to have to play this game for three hours if I want to get anything out of it. I want to play something like Hell Divers when I can just drop in, have fun, screw around, and also vicariously gain enough things to just unlock the things that I want. That really is not necessarily, not that's respecting your time, not in just a gamer sense, but also respecting your time in like almost the generation that we don't, in today's culture, that we don't have all the time to sit down and do nothing but play a game. You know, we want yeah. to play it quickly for an hour or two and then get the things that we want and then after a couple of weeks or a few weeks of doing things after work we can get something of as a reward that feels like you're actually consistently working towards something in a short-term goal because like you said you know if, we, if you have a full-time job you know you have much less time to play but you have the money to buy the games right so having a game that respects your time it makes it worth your money by the way, if uh, even though we only have like 30 seconds, if some if more so solid, so you want to try out the grenade launcher, I called one in. Get out of the right. Pelican. <laughs> Did it drop me inside it? Oh, um, Where am I? Colin, where's the Pelican? Um, 
Where did he go? I'm inside uh, the know. pelican. Uh, yeah, by the way, if you land on the pelican with a uh, pod, it bugs the pelican out. Uh, you might be extracting alone. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I, I dropped right oh, on top of it and it put me directly into the seat. Oh, you see it? Yep, I'm out. All right, well, thanks, guys, for the content. See you later! <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> Viewers exploited. Goals. <laughs> For what it is worth, I apologize. I did not know. <laughs> hey, 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 we were all laughing about it. I, I consider that a win. <laughs> right? Mission complete, mournful <laughs> victory. <laughs> well, thank you, DigiDees, for watching the video. We've been playing with along with a couple of viewers that have been enjoying the channel and enjoying the videos in general. So, hey, by the way, I met them through the Discord. So, feel free to join the Discord. That is going to be in the description down below. If you guys are enjoying the Hell Divers 2 content in general, feel free to. Make sure to subscribe, like the video, and all that fun stuff because that is actually going to be the only way I know that you guys enjoy this. More than just views, the likes and comments, and all that fun stuff really does give me feedback and knowing if you guys enjoy the content. So hey, I still don't really know how to do any of these outros, but there's one thing that I can always guarantee you. I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you, and bye bye